<clears throat> well, guys, let's go ahead and stand together. Lord, we know you're coming back soon, and we know when that trumpet sounds, Lord, uh, we are going to be with you. We're going to be raised to be with you, and it's all because of your sacrifice for us. When the roll is called up yonder, Lord, we know that we're going we're gonna to be there in your presence. And it's not because of anything that we've done, Lord, but it's, it's, it's by your grace. It's because of your great sacrifice. And we celebrate that today, Lord. When the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound in times of you. Wait. Oh, what a fellowship. Gonna yourself. have to pray all over again. Different <laughs> prayer. <laughs> what a fellowship. Here we go. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. reading today. I'm going to be reading from uh, Luke's gospel. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land, wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. 
when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. All right. Go ahead and uh, have a seat. Uh, Bert's not here for our announcements, but I've got a couple for you. <clears throat> Again, birthday cards on the back if uh, you want to make sure you get those signed, if you haven't signed those. The uh, farmer's market, I believe we just have one more Saturday. Next Saturday, August 31st, will be the last of our farmer's market. So uh, if you haven't been down there, come down, check things out. What else do we have there? Birthdays for this week. Uh, you can see those up there. Um, okay. <coughs> And semi-annual potluck meeting. Uh, that would be September 15th after the service. Sunday school confirmation begins September 22nd. I know it's kind of an early announcement, but we're getting close. Uh, Wednesday evening Bible study, dinner, 6 o'clock. That'll begin September 25th. And the harvest celebration coming up the end of September. All right. Any other announcements anybody have? Okay. All right. We, today's our day to be at the nursing home. It's kind of interesting for me. I go, I've gone over there a few times with the pastor to do the little service with the people there, and it's kind of interesting. I've been 50 years, 1974, both my grandparents, Anderson, were in the nursing home. And even before that, my mom would drag me over there. So I've been doing that for 50 years off and on. It's kind of interesting. And then in the 90s, my other grandma was in there for a while. And then dad, that's already been 11 years ago. So nothing, or things, faces change, but the place stays the same. Yeah, we had a great, tell them about that photo we got the other week. Oh yeah, well, well, when, my, when Melissa and the, the all the, both our kids and then Melissa's daughters were here. We went over there on Sunday afternoon, so we were there and we got a picture. And there was this lady. We don't know who she was, but she was in our kind of photo bombed our picture from the front. It was kind of interesting, but Melissa <laughs> figured out a way to edit that out. So. Uh, if you'd like to stand, you can for this song. Then. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Oh, 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 oh. oh, 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 oh. to say is here to set the captives free for who can stop the Lord Almighty our God is the Lion the Lion of Judah he's roaring with power and fighting the battles and every knee will bow before him our God the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Stop the Lord, our God is alive. 
the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee You can have a seat if you'd like. <clears throat> now we can do when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. <coughs> when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called the thunder, I'll be there When the roll is called the yonder When the roll is called the yonder When the roll is called the yonder When the roll is called the yonder, I'll be there on that bright and cloud this morning when the dead in Christ shall rise And the glory of His resurrection share When His chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder Yonder I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the rose called of yonder I'll be there. When the rose is called of yonder, when the rose The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he said. And time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great!
Above all names, Lord, uh, certainly the name of Jesus is the name of above all names and worthy of all praise. And, and Lord, as we just gather here this morning, we just bring glory to the name of your Son. We just lift up his holy name. How great is our God! How great is our God! We know you hear us, Lord, today as uh, we just want to lift up. Uh, Linda and Doug to you, just continuing to keep them in our prayers. And Lord, uh, asking for you to continue to strengthen her. Lord, our prayer as, as her family here would just be for healing for her, miraculous healing. But we know in all things, Lord, you're working for her good. And uh, Lord, we just thank you that uh, you're providing for her every need daily. Constantly, you're just you're there with her. She's your child, and you're you're going to minister to her, Lord. And uh, we thank you, Father. Thank you for that, Lord. I want to lift up uh, our uh, teachers as they go back to school this week, for the students who will be uh, starting again, uh, especially Dawson, his senior year. And Lord, uh, w what a blessing! I just pray, Father, that uh, you'd. Use this year to be a great, a great blessing to him and for uh, all the others who are starting, for the teachers especially, Lord Jesus. We lift these up to you now, Jesus, your name. Amen. Go ahead and say hi to those around you. I think we're ready to get started. Parker wasn't here last week, so while he's here, I've, you all know that uh, congratulations due to Parker and JD for uh, their engagement. Woo! We're excited. <laughs> we're excited. All right, uh, we're in Ezekiel this morning. Uh, we're making our way through the major prophets. And you know that there's five of the major prophets. 
Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And uh, we will, uh, after, kind of got another, I think one more I want to do in Ezekiel, and then we'll move on to Daniel. We'll finish up the major prophets. Uh, the last 13 chapters of Daniel are all prophecy about what's coming in the future. And last week we looked at uh, one of those prophecies, Ezekiel 36 and 30, 37. And that is uh, God's faithfulness in bringing his people, the nation of uh, Israel, back into the land. They had been dispersed for nearly 2,000 years, and God brought them back into the land. May 14th, 1948. That was actually a Friday. And uh, last week I asked if anybody remembered that happening. And uh, if anyone was old enough to have remembered that. And as we were leaving, Shirley Strandy came up to me and she said, I remember that. I remember that. I was in church on that Sunday after that happened in Watertown. And the pastor said that Israel was back in the land, that it was a fulfillment of the prophecy that we had here in Ezekiel. And it was a powerful moment. And, and uh, it was powerful, wasn't it, Shirley? I mean, I could tell Shirley was impacted. Here, here, this was 76 years ago, and you still felt that when you were telling me about it last week. It was still an emotional thing. Still moved, still moved. Uh, scripture being fulfilled. That was so awesome. Um, this week, I want to take a look at Ezekiel chapter 38, and it's this next prophecy. And it talks about this uh, battle that's coming up. And this battle that we see in Ezekiel 38 is, I believe, part of this battle that kind of spreads out in these last years before Jesus returns. And it's the battle of Armageddon. And this kind of is the beginning of this. So uh, looking at Ezekiel 38, I want to read down uh, first six verses to start. Very interesting prophecy. So as the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Gog, G-O-G, and the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So it's G-O-D, God, God says I'm against you, Gog. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets. Also, Gomer with all its troops and Bethargarma from the far north with all its troops the many and many nations with you. And then skipping down to verse 14. Um, 14 says, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, this is what the sovereign Lord says, in that day when my people Israel are living in safety, will you not take notice of it? And you will come from your place in the far north. Now, everything, whenever you read directions, is all, it all has to do with where Israel is. So when you're talking about far north, you're talking about from Israel, from Jerusalem. You will come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. And you will advance against my people Israel like a cloud, that covers the land. In days to come, Gog, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. So here God predicts through the prophet Ezekiel that these armies are going to advance and they're going to come from the north. And the thing is, God says, I'm the one who's going to bring this whole thing about. It isn't something that they're going to plant. They may plan it, but God says, I'm the one who is going to make this all happen. He says, in the days to come, 
I will bring you against my land. So God is the one who's behind all of this. And he wants to do this because when he brings them against his people, Israel, he's the one who's going to get the glory in defeating them, in destroying this nation that's coming. Now, Ezekiel names one person here, and he names six different places, six different other territories or nations. Verse 2, son of man, set your face against Gog. That's a person. And it's actually a title. Uh, it could be a, a prince. It could be a president. It could be a czar. But it is, it's a person that he's talking about here. So he says, son of man, set your face against Gog. Um, and this, this person Gog, whoever it is, this title, is over a region called Magog. And you read those and you go, what in the world? Where is this place? What is he talking about here? Set your face against God, the land of Magog. Historians, and, and you go back to uh, the 5th century B.C., Herodotus, and then you come along to uh, the 1st century A.D., and you have Josephus and Pliny. They all said the same thing about this land of Magog. They said that it was the ancient land of the Scythians, and you go, that doesn't help me at all. It was actually a, the territory that is north of the Black Sea, and it is north of the Caspian Sea. So we're talking far north. And today we know that as the land of Russia. He's talking about here the land of Russia. So when reading this passage, to bring it into modern terms, it would be son of man, Ezekiel. Set your face against Gog, who is the ruler of this territory, Russia, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, prophesy against him. Now, Meshach and Tubal, uh, it is the area of modern-day Meshach, is modern-day Moscow. Tubal is modern-day Tobolsk. And if you go on a map, right there in the center of Russia, you can see Moscow, and then you travel east a long journey and you come to this area of Tobolsk. And what he's saying here is these are the cities that Gog is over. I mean, it's this territory that we know as Russia. And God says in verse 4, I will turn you around. I will put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army. Now, I is God here. And he's saying, I will bring you the leader of Russia, and I'm wondering if this couldn't be possibly Vladimir Putin. I mean, he very much could be used in this way by God. I'm, it could be. It very well could be. Um, he thinks he's making his own plans, the leader of Russia, but God says, I'm drawing you into this battle, and I am going to do it so that I can be glorified. You remember when the, uh, the children of Israel went out and they went through the Red Sea. Pharaoh was chasing them into the desert to bring them back. And when they got to the Red Sea, he thought, all right, here I have them. But God did all of that so that God would be glorified. He opened up the Red Sea. His people went through on dry ground. And then God closed it in on Pharaoh's army. And it's the same thing that God is talking about here. I am going to bring this nation down against my people. Hasn't happened yet. But he says, I'm going to do this in the end times. And when they come, I am going to glorify myself. I am going to destroy this nation in the same way that I did with Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And I am going to be glorified in the, in the voices of my people by what has happened. Now, joining Russia in this invasion, he names five other places, and that's ver verse 5. He says, Persia, Cush, and Put. And then he also mentions another place, Gomer and Torgarma. Now, where are these places? 
Persia is easy to figure out because um, it's the ancient name of Iran. Uh, it was uh, the name, it was Persia all the way up until 1935, and then the name was changed to Iran. I think they've changed it since. In 1979, uh, Iran was actually changed to the Islamic Republic of Iran. But before all of that, it was, it was Persia. So when you're reading this here, you know, it's interesting right now that, that Russia and Iran have a close relationship, something that has never happened. In all of history, you see this closeness. Uh, Iran hates the United States, hates Israel. United, Iran calls the United States, you know, you've heard, you know, the great Satan. And they call Israel the little Satan. They have purchased billions and billions of dollars of weaponry from Russia. And they have this you know, this, this alliance that already exists and their desire is to destroy Israel, that is Iran, destroy Israel and to destroy the United States if they could, if they could. And all of this is setting the stage for these events that are taking place in Ezekiel chapter 38, this war of Gog and Magog. So, um, he mentions there's first Persia, then he says Cush and Put. And Bible, Bible scholars actually say that this is the countries of, in northern Africa. And if you read a, a different version of scripture, I, I was looking at the new, uh, let's see, the New Living Translation. And it actually puts the modern day equivalent to where those countries are. It says it'll be per Persia, uh, Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya. So you have these countries of northern Africa that will be joining Russia and Iran in coming against Israel. Islamic nations, these is Islamic nations from northern Africa. And then in verse 6, there's Gomer and Torgarma. Uh, Gomer, I found that uh, these were nations from Eastern Europe, and then there's Torgarma, which is modern day, the area that is now Turkey. So when you look at all of this, there's never been an alliance like this, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. But you look in the news and you see these three who are all working together right at this time. And then it says many nations, many nations will come. And uh, this suggests that there's this beginning of the battle and then there's nations that are going to come and they're going to join in this battle. And then jumping down to verse 13. And there's going to be some who are going to complain about this, obviously. I mean, if you have Russia, Iran, Turkey, some other nations that are coming against little Israel, you're going to have some opposition. And it does say here in verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods and to seize much plunder? So there's, there will be those who are going to say, speak out against this. But it's interesting, you don't see anybody that comes in to say, no, we're going to stand against you. But they are giving voice saying, wait, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sheba, you know in scripture, there's the queen of Sheba. So we can identify where she was from. This area of Sheba and Dedan, they're both actually the same area, is modern day Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia. So these nations begin to come against Israel, and Saudi Arabia says, wait, 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 stop. What are you doing? And today, Saudi Arabia actually has a peace treaty with Israel. So, I mean, it, it seems, you know, it's setting, things are setting up. Now, I can't say how close this is, but wow, when you look at the, the nations and how they're gathering, it's very interesting. Tarshish 
You go, well, where is Tarshish located? Do you remember in uh, the book of Jonah? We're told that Jonah got on the boat and he was fleeing from Joppa to Tarshish. Well, Tarshish, uh, one historian, Herodotus, said uh, this is located beyond the pillars of Hercules. Well, where's that? Uh, it's the rock pillars that uh, form the entrance there of the Mediterranean Sea known as the Strait of Gibraltar, the rocks of Gibraltar. And he said that Tarshish was not in the Mediterranean, but it was out in the ocean, out in the Atlantic. And most Bible scholars believe that what he's talking about when he talks about Tarshish is England. So if it is England, um, it says here, and, and I'm not, you know, I can't be 100% sure. You're just not, not, but if it is, and scholars believe, say that it very well could be, it says that it would be Tarshish and all of her villages. King James says all her young lions, and we know that the national symbol of England, it's, it's a lion. And again, many scholars believe that this is reference to territories or colonies that used to be part of England, which would mean that would kind of be a mention of maybe us, maybe the United States, because we used to be tied to England through a colony. Um, so when he talks about the villages or the young lions of this nation Tarshish, uh, some believe that this is a kind of a veiled reference to the United States. And I think that's interesting because why aren't we jumping in on this? You know, if, if Russia is coming down against our ally, Israel, where are we? I mean, are we just going to stand back and go, hey, that's not a good idea. What are you doing? What are you doing? Why wouldn't we be jumping in on this? Uh, a couple of reasons. It could be, uh, this is at the very end of time. This is before, just before Jesus returns. This is leading right into this battle of Armageddon. Right after the Armageddon, or right during the battle of Armageddon, Jesus returns. So it could be that the church has been taken already in the rapture before this. And if that's the case, millions of Christians have gone and the United States is perhaps in an impossible situation after the rapture. No longer a world power, just trying to maybe gather that, you know, we're, this nation's trying to gather itself. Another possibility is uh, maybe we've ceased to care for Israel. Uh, maybe she's no longer a close ally of, of us. And we can see that, I think, more and more as a possibility. Uh, the Democrat Party is not a strong supporter of Israel. And I think as we move forward, you know, we could see that become more and more evident that uh, we aren't going to support Israel in the way that we have in the past. So maybe we would say, what are you doing? Russia, what are, we, what are you doing in, in coming against them? But we're not coming to their aid. Another alternative is uh, that our country has had some kind of an attack from the outside, or there's civil war. Um, a civil war would be something that our enemies would love to see happen. Um, you know, if there's so much inner strife and contention and war within our own country, we can't help. We can't reach out and do anything, but we might just give a few words of what are you doing. And then Ezekiel concludes with uh, the words, then they will know that I am the Lord. Because nobody's coming to the defense of Israel. And, but God says, that's okay. Because I've set it up this way. I am going to come to their aid. And if you're going to have somebody come to your aid, God's the one you want, right? I mean, he's going to come down and he is going to destroy the nation. As small as Israel is, remember how small, I mentioned it last week, small, as small as Rhode Island or New Jersey. Which one's smaller? I think New Jersey. It's like this little nation with all these nations of the world coming down upon it and God says, I'm going to take care of this and I want the world to know I am God. 
So Ezekiel 38, um, 18 through 23 gives a description of what those times are going to look like. And I'm going to read through those verses, and I'm going to have you note a couple of words, and then I'm going to jump over to Revelation chapter 16, because Revelation chapter 16 is the only place in the Bible that talks about Armageddon. It's the only time that the word Armageddon is used, and when you look at the words that are being used here and the words that are used there, I, it, there's, there's such a similarity that you think that this either has to be the battle of Armageddon or it's leading into this final battle before Jesus returns. So, Ezekiel 38, beginning in verse 18. This is what will happen in that day when Gog attacks the land of Israel. My hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath. So, kind of mark that one out. I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake. Mark that out in the land of Israel. There's going to be a great earthquake. Verse 20, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the birds of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned. Mark that. The cliffs will crumble and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon the sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment on him with plague. Mark that one. And bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones. Mark that one and burning sulfur on him and on his troops and on the many nations with him. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. And then he concludes, then they will know that I am the Lord. And that last verse, I love it. The uh, message version of the Bible puts it this way. And so they, I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, and then they will know that I am the Lord. The Amplified puts it this way. Thus I shall magnify myself and demonstrate my greatness and sanctify myself, and I will be recognized and will make myself known in the sight of many nations. They will know without any doubt that I am the Lord. So this is God doing it. I mean, he's the one who's pulling Russia into this conflict. He's the one who's pulling Iran into it. He's the one who's pulling Turkey and, and the various nations of the world right there in uh, the, the battle of, you know, right there in the, the valley of Megiddo, north of Jer uh, Jerusalem. So God's desire is that his people would know him. And uh, he's the one who's going to come to Israel's aid. Now, I want to compare this with Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 38. And again, this is the only place in Scripture that mentions this battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. And just before Revelation 16, 16, the verses that are leading up to this passage talks about this great army that's going to be coming from the east. And it says that it's an army of 200 million. We've never had a 200 million army that's been able to march on this earth. 200 million coming from the east, from China. I don't know who would be joining them. Uh, Pakistan, North Korea. But you have this vast army that's moving in this direction also. Um, so what I think happens here, and it's hard when you get to prophecy to kind of line it all up and say, okay, this happens, and this happens, and this happens. But it seems to be that you have Russia coming down, you have this battle, God gets the victory in this battle, now you have nations moving into the Middle East with the Antichrist, with China, and then you have this 
final battle, it concludes with this battle of Armageddon. It seems like this is kind of all together in this one place. Now, re remember these words that we read in uh, Ezekiel 38, earthquake and wrath, mountains being leveled, hail, stones, and a great plague. This is what uh, Revelation 16 says, verse 16. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and here you have a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. Verse 19, the great city, that is Jerusalem, split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. There's the word wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. Again, what Ezekiel was talking about. Uh, verse 21, from the sky, huge hailstones. And again, Ezekiel spoke about hailstones. John, in writing Revelation, he says, each of those hailstones weighing about 100 pounds fell on people. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Uh, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague, and we read about the plague that was going to take place in Ezekiel also, because the plague was so terrible. So there's similar things that are happening in Ezekiel. Uh, that, that seem to give you the understanding that these two things are colliding, what's taking place there and then what's taking place here at the end of time before Jesus returns, all leading to this battle of Armageddon. Jesus would say in uh, Luke chapter 21, he said, before I return, he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs in the heavens. Matthew, saw, talking about the same thing, said it's, it's birth pains. You're going to have these birth pains, and it's going to, you know, a birth pain is, it kind of starts weak, and it just gets stronger, and they get closer together. And I think what we're seeing right now are these birth pains. And we're get, we see it, you know, there's a strong one, and then we have a little bit of a time, and then there's a strong one, but they're getting stronger and they're getting closer together. I can't say when, I can't say exactly when this is all going to come about, but I do see us moving in this direction. Birth pains. And then Luke concludes when he's talking about, when Jesus is saying these things and Luke is writing them down, says, when these things begin to take place, there's going to be a lot of fear on the earth, a lot of terror. He says, when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He says, there's no need to, be, to fear any of this, anything that's coming, because I have got it all under control. Stand up, lift up your head, because he says, I'm coming. Your Savior is coming. Your redemption is here. Um, and really, this is what we've been waiting for. Revelation chapter 19. After you read this, talking about this battle, then we come to Revelation 19 in verse 11. John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. That's Jesus. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Now notice verse 14. The armies of heaven were following him. That's actually us. We've been taking the churches with him. 
he's returning now to in this battle of Armageddon and it's not going to be even fought. Jesus just speaks and all of those who are gathered are just done. And it says, we are riding with him as he returns to set up his kingdom, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So, again, he, you know, he's coming. And that's, that's the message today. He's coming, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, maybe soon. He's coming. And it, as the song says, oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. So David and Heidi are going to come up, and we're just going to a cappella sing, coming again, coming again. So let's go ahead and stand. There we go. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe your promise. You've said you're going to come back, and uh, we don't know when that's going to be exactly, but wow, when we look around, we see the birth pains. We can feel the birth pains, and we see the world lining up in such a way, Lord, that uh, Scripture is being fulfilled. So, Lord, we know that you've just told us, keep our eyes toward heaven. Our redemption draws nigh. And, Lord, not to be afraid of anything that might come up. So, Lord, we, as we go our way today, just to help us to remember it could, be, it could be morning, could be noon, it could be soon, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. <laughs> 